everyone, this is Dr. Lennon. Today we're going to go over the final exam review. Um, so the first one is just finding the equation of a line. So it's a topic in the pre-calculus, but comes up a lot using the derivative because we're always interested in finding the equation of tangent lines. So the first thing we want to do is find the slope. So remember the slope formula is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So the slope here is going to be given by 7 minus 5 divided by 2 minus negative 2, which simplifies to 2 over 4, or a half. So then we know that our line has to have equation y equals 1 half x plus some y-intercept b. So you can plug in either point to figure out what that y-intercept is. I'm going to go ahead and plug in the first point. So 5 replaces y, and negative 2 replaces x. And that's all we have to do now is add 1 to both sides to solve for b, which is our y-intercept. So 6 is equal to b, so the equation of our line is y equals 1 half x plus 6. And one thing you can do to check that that answer is correct is you can always plug in your x values and make sure they line up. So if you plug in negative 2 for x, you certainly get 5 for y, and if you plug in 2 for x, you get 7 for y. So uh, that checks with our equation. So let's go ahead and move on to number two. So for number two, we want to uh, do a chain rule. So we're finding the derivative. So we notice that our inside function is the x squared plus one inside the parentheses. And then if you would replace that with a t, you would end up with t to the 100. So we take the derivative of each one of those things. So x prime would just be 2x. And the derivative of the outside with respect to t would be 100t to the 99th. And then we just to find the derivative, we multiply that bottom row, so we're multiplying 2x by the 100, and then we need to change t back into the inside function. It's really just a placeholder, var placeholder variable for the inside. So, um, because it itself represents a function of x. So we replace t by x squared plus 1 in parentheses, and then all that is raised to the 99th power. Um, so you can't multiply any of the other things with the x squared plus 1 because that's the only thing raised to the 99th, but you can multiply 2x and 100. So we can write our final answer as uh, 200x times quantity x squared plus 1 to the 99th, and that is the derivative there. Okay, so for problem number three, we need to uh, sketch the graph of the derivative of each function. So we have to sketch two graphs. So I'll go below. Um, this will represent the graph of the derivative for part A. So again, the first thing you want to do is kind of identify all of your hills and valleys. So those are the ones with the flat horizontal tangent line. So this point, this point, and this point are all local maxes or mins. So at the corresponding x points, at the same exact time, those have tangent lines whose slope is zero. So those have to be x-intercepts. And then basically from there, we can figure out what the rest of the graph is going to look like, because if the function is increasing, the y values have to be positive, and if it's decreasing, they have to be negative. So basically, we have to be above the x-axis, left of the first dot. Between dots one and two, we have to be below the x-axis. Between dots 2 and 3, we have to be above because the original function is increasing. And then finally, we have to be below. So essentially, this graph is going to just look something like this. I didn't dip very far below, so this is a little bit bad. I should be more like this, something like that. And that would be a decent graph of f prime of x. You don't have to be any that, that precise. You just have to show the main properties. If you go back to uh, the section in the notes, we actually kind of had a checklist for uh, what to look for for each thing. So we would always start with kind of maxes and mins, and then from there we would go to increasing, decreasing, and then if need be, we would even look for inflection points. So sorry, I've just kind of botched this up. So probably I'm going to make it worse, but it was bothering me. Okay, so we have this point, and then we have this thing coming down up and then down. Okay, so that's a little bit better. For B, uh, we only have one local max, so we start there. This point right here is a local max, so that means 
at the same x value, we're going to have an x-intercept on the derivative graph. And we're increasing before that point, so we have positive y values to the left and uh, negative x values to the right. The thing is, to the left, they're getting steeper and steeper. So as you get steeper, you move farther away from the x-axis. But to the right, they get flatter and eventually approach an asymptote. So as we approach an asymptote, what that means is, in fact, our slope values are getting nearer and nearer to zero. As they get nearer and nearer to zero, we saw if a function ever approaches a horizontal asymptote, what that means for the derivative graph is it's going to have to approach the x-axis as an asymptote. So basically this graph right here is approaching the x-axis asymptotically. So again, if, if this is a little bit tricky, I would suggest you go back to uh, the section where we looked at derivative graphs and we gave a bunch of examples and a checklist of properties to follow from there. Okay, for number four, we're looking for local extrema. So the first thing is find the derivative. Uh, pretty straightforward. We're just using the uh, power rule on each term individually. So 3x squared over 3, the 3's cancel. Um, so I'll, I'll write down all the steps. So we get 3x squared over 3 minus 2 times 3 in front, which is 6x, and then plus 8. So this uh, simplifies to x squared minus 6x plus 8. So for part B, we want to identify local extrema. Which means we want to set that first derivative equal to 0. And then from there, uh, set up some test value regions. So we get 0 equals x squared minus 6x plus 8. So 0 is equal to, this factors as x minus 4 times x minus 2. So your two critical values are x equals 2 or x equals 4. So we can set up our test value regions. And the test value regions we want to see basically 2 and 4 div uh, divide all of the real numbers into three separate regions, region 1, 2, and 3. And we want to plug a point from each region into the first derivative. So the simplest version of the first derivative is the x squared minus 6x plus 8. And we want to see whether or not the first derivative is positive or negative when you plug in any point there. So uh, the easiest region is region 1 because 0 lives in region 1. So if you plug 0 into f prime, so f prime of 0, the x squared will go away, the minus 6 will go away, and you'll just be left with the 8. So f prime is greater than 0. So we get a uh, positive first derivative. So that means f is increasing. For the second region, we would want to plug in some number like 3. So 3 squared minus 6 times 3 plus 8 uh, would be minus 1. So in region 2, the first derivative is negative, which means f is decreasing. And then in the third region, uh, you can plug in any number larger than 4. So if you go ahead and plug in 5, you'll end up with 3. 5 squared minus 6 times 5 plus 8 is 3. So again, the first derivative is positive, so that means f is increasing. So from the first derivative test, when you change from increasing to decreasing, you're going to be on the top of a hill. And when you change from decreasing to increasing, you're going to be at the bottom of a valley. So basically that tells me we're getting a local max at x equals 2 and a uh, local min at x equals 4. So uh, from the first derivative test. Uh, local max occurs at x equals 2 and a local min at x equals 4. All right, so that's it for identifying the local extrema. Whoops. So for number five, we're finding absolute extrema, which means we can apply the extreme value theorem. So that's all we have to do is identify the critical points, and then we plug in all critical points and endpoints. So our endpoints are negative one and four because that's the interval that we're uh, examining this continuous function over. 
So uh, first derivative, let's start there. F prime of x is 12x cubed minus 48x squared plus 36x. So we can set that equal to zero and solve to find our critical points. And uh, what is the GCF? What is the greatest thing we can take out of these? Um, so to me, it looks like, uh, well, nine doesn't work. Uh, six can definitely come out of all of them. Uh, 12 can as well. So 12x is our greatest common factor. So then that becomes x squared minus 4x uh, plus 9. So uh, one of our factors is just x equals 0. So the only either 12x equals 0, so 12x equals 0, or this polynomial x squared minus 4x plus 9 equals 0. And the only way 12x equals 0 is if x equals 0. The x squared minus 4x plus 9, the uh, that can be solved. Typically, we would try factoring, but it doesn't look like factoring will work here. So we're going to have to use the uh, quadratic formula. So in fact, I've noticed there's actually a little error here. We don't have to worry about the quadratic formula. Um, I factored out the 12 wrong. For some reason, I wrote a 9. Uh, 12x, 36x divided by 12x is just 3. So uh, x squared minus 4x plus 3 equals 0. So this will factor. This factors into x minus 3 times x minus 1 equals zero. So our two solutions uh, there are going to be, again, our x equals zero or x equals three or x equals one. Okay, so we're plugging in these three values and also our two endpoints, negative one and four. So in this case, for absolute extrema, we're plugging them into the original function. So f of x, not f prime of x. So we need to do f of negative one, f of zero, f of one, f of three, and f of four, the last endpoint. And once we figure out those, we can just compare their y values. The biggest one will be our absolute max, and the smallest one will be our absolute min. So we want to plug these into the original function 3x to the fourth minus 16x cubed plus 18x squared. So let me go ahead and uh, grab a calculator and I will do that. So uh, zero is obviously an easy one to plug in. We know if, since they all have x's with them, if you plug in zero, you'll get zero. Um, if you plug in negative one, we'll get positive three plus 16, which is 19, 19 plus 18 is 37. So we'll get 37 here for f of negative one. f of one will be three minus 16, negative 13 plus 18 is gonna be five. And then three and four, maybe we wanna to appeal to the calculator. So three times three to the fourth, minus 16 times three to the third, uh, plus 18 times three squared comes out to minus 27 and f of 4 3 times 4 to the fourth minus 16 times 4 to the third uh, plus 18 times 4 squared um, comes out to 32 so it looks like our largest y value is at x equals negative one, uh, which is 37. So this is gonna be our absolute max. And our smallest y value is negative 27. That occurs at x equals three. So this is gonna be our absolute min. And so in some ways it's a little bit easier because we can just plug things into the function and compare rather than doing test value regions uh, like we have to do for local extrema. So here we want to find the equation of the tangent line at x equals 1 uh, to this function. So we need two ingredients, a point and a slope. So we get a point by plugging x into the uh, equation there to find the y value. So y will equal 1 cubed plus 2 times 1 squared minus 5 times 1 plus 7. So y is equal to 
1 plus 2 minus 5 plus 7. So we get y is equal to uh, 5. So our point is 1 comma 5. Now we need to find the slope. So to find the slope, we want to find the derivative and then plug 1 into the derivative. And then once we know the point and the slope, we can just reduce this basically to uh, the same problem as, uh, as number 1 on the review. So we're just finding the equation of a line. So uh, y prime here is going to be 3x squared plus 4x minus 5. And when you plug in 1, y prime of 1 is going to be 3 plus 4 minus 5. So uh, our slope is going to be equal to 2. So it's the value there. So basically the equation of our line has to look like y equals 2x plus some b value. And then we want to plug in 1 and 5. So 5 for y and 1 for x. Subtract 2 and we get our y-intercept value of 3. So we have y equals 2x plus 3, which is the equation of the tangent line to the point 1 comma 5 for the given equation. Okay, so for number 7, uh, we've got a related rates problem. Uh, this one's a ladder sliding down a wall. So basically what we've got is we've got some wall, we've got the ground, we've got a ladder with the top falling. So if the top is falling this direction, the bottom of the ladder is sliding away at this direction. Um, so in general, you can uh, relate the sides. We know that the ladder is 20 feet long. Uh, so in general, what's going to happen is if we call the, using the usual conventions, we call the horizontal side x, the vertical side y, and we have 20. We have our equation that relates the variables. We have x squared plus y squared has to equal 20 squared or 400. Um, but what is the rate that we want in this problem? It says what is the rate of the top of the ladder sliding down when the bottom is 12 feet? So we want to know dy dt when x is equal to 20 or when, 12, when x is equal to 12. Um, what are we given? Well, we're given some rates. Uh, we're given the bottom of the ladder is sliding away from the wall at 2 feet per second. So we're given dx dt is equal to 2. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to take this equation and differentiate implicitly. So we end up with 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt equals 0. Uh, you can divide both sides by 2 to simplify a bit. x dx dt plus y dy dt equals 0, dividing both sides of the equation by 2. Uh, we know dx dt is 2, we know x is 12. We want to find dy dt, but we don't know y. So basically what we have to do is we want to use the relationship between x, y, and 20 to solve for y at that time. So we know when x is 12, 12 squared plus y squared has to equal 20 squared. So we get 144 plus y squared equals 400. If you subtract 144 from both sides, we get y squared equals 256. And if you take the square root, y will end up being, uh, so the square root of 256, which I believe is, uh, let's see, I think that's uh, 16. So uh, we can plug those things in. Again, we're gonna replace x by two. Uh, sorry, we're going to replace x by 12 and dx dt by 2. So x becomes 12, dx dt becomes 2, y becomes 16, and we're trying to solve for dy dt. So we end up with 24 plus 16 dy dt equals 0. And then basically you just subtract 24 and divide by 12. So uh, dy dt comes out uh, to be negative 24 over 16. Both of those are divisible by eight. So that just reduces to negative three over two. And remember that's gonna be in feet per second.
uh, because those are our original units. So when the bottom of the ladder is 12 feet from the wall, the top is sliding downward. The negative indicates the downward direction at ne <laughs> negative 3 over 2 feet per second or negative 1.5 feet per second. So for 8, we have the radius of a circle expanding by 1.5 centimeter per minute. Uh, how fast is the area increasing the moment the radius has 10? Uh, has radius 10. So for this one, basically, uh, we need to remember the formula uh, area is equal to pi r squared. A lot of times I like to change this problem up and do it with a semicircle. The only difference between the area formula for a circle and a semicircle, a semicircle is a half circle. So in a semicircle problem, area would be pi squared, uh, pi r squared divided by 2. Uh, so, all right, so what are we given and what do we want? Uh, we're given uh, the radius, so dr dt, we're given dr dt is equal to 1.5. What is it that we want to find? What rate do we want to know? We want to know how fast the area is changing, so that's dA dt at the time. Um, at the time the radius is 10, so when r equals 10. So we just differentiate implicitly, so dA dt is going to be 2 pi r dr dt, and then dA dt is already solved for, so we just plug in the things that we have. Not too much work here, so 2 pi r is uh, 10, and dr dt uh, it was given was 1.5. So uh, I'm just going to round this to two decimal places. You could leave it in terms of pi, which it looks like is just coming out to 30 pi. Um, so how much is 30 pi as a de in, in two decimal places? 94.25. So this would be 94.25. Since it's area, it's going to be centimeters squared per minute since it's the rate of change of the area rather than just a single uh, one-dimensional object. All right, number nine, we have a maximum word problem. Um, we want to maximize area. So um, again, we've got what's going on here. We've got a fence against a long wall, or sometimes it's a river in this problem. So basically, you have one side you don't have to use a fence for, and then the other side you do. So let's call these sides Y, this side X. We have 64 yards of fence. Uh, so I don't know why I wrote a two. Clearly a little bit tired. Um, so we know x plus 2y has to equal 64. Um, again, a lot of times we want to replace x. So x is given by 64 minus 2y if we solve for x. So the thing we want to optimize is the area, which is uh, x times y. That would be the area formula. So uh, we can replace x by 64 minus 2y. So our if we expand that, we get 64y minus 2y squared. So now what we want to do is just take the derivative and solve for y. So uh, a prime is 64 minus 4y. So set that equal to 0, and we get 64 minus 4y. Um, so 64 is equal to 4y. And if you divide by 4, you get y equals 16. So 16 yards is the dimension for y. So that means x is 64 minus 2y, so x is 32 yards. So those are the dimensions that maximize your area. And remember, x is the side that's got to be parallel to the long wall. Um, otherwise, the dimensions won't work. Okay, so last one, we want to do an area approximation uh, below the natural log of x using five left rectangles. So again, we want to find the width of each rectangle if we partition them of equal length. So that will be the bounder, uh, the x values, 3 minus 1, divided by the number of rectangles. So this will come out to 0.4. So now we can identify what our partition looks like. So we start at 1, and then we count by 0.4s <clears throat> until we get up to 3. So we have 1, 1.4, 1 
1.8, 2.2, 2.6, and finally 3. So for this uh, left rectangle, we're only using the first five points. Remember, um, if we had like a picture, well, basically, what is this picture going to look like? We're using five rectangles. We're going from one to three. So um, the log picture is essentially looking something like this. So basically, we have one rectangle, two rectangles, three, four, and five. So basically this point right here is one and this point right here is three. So this is our picture. But to figure the, the widths of all these rectangles is the same. They're all 0.4, but the heights are figured out by plugging these values into the function. And those five dots, the y values are gonna represent our heights. So remember any rectangles is gonna be base times height. So that's how we get the basically approximate area using the left rectangle method here. So that's just that 0.4. And then we're plugging uh, this into our function, which is the natural log of x. So we get 0.4 times the natural log of 1 plus the natural log of 1.4 plus the natural log of 1.8 plus the natural log of 2.2 plus the natural log of 2.6. And that's it. So we just type that into the calculator and we get our result. So 0.4 times the natural log of 1.1 1. 1 plus 1.4 1 plus natural log of 1.8 uh, plus natural log of 2.2 plus natural log of 2.6. And we get about 1.07 for our answer. And that is it. So um, that is how you would use left rectangles. If we were using right rectangles, we would just use the top right corners. Uh, notice since these are this is an increasing function, the left rectangle method would be an under approximation of the true area. Whereas if we did right rectangles, it would be an over approximation. But um, this question just asks for the left, so that's all we do. So this is Dr. London signing off.